Persia. Um, please excuse the English for the presentation. I'm an uneducated American, so you know how that goes. So we'll see if this works. So <clears throat> as was mentioned, my name is Brian Prophet. I am the community liaison for the Overt Project. And I'm going to be talking, um, overlapping uh, Heikel's talk uh, a bit with talking about Project Atomic, but also um, speaking about other cloud-based technologies and describing how this should all fit together. Because right now, containers are a very hot topic. It's, you know, all about Docker. It's all about LXC. How will that work? Is that the next big thing? And I would say that that might not be the case. So let's see if this works. Okay, good. So before I begin, a brief history of operating systems. This is a map of the universe um, just after the Big Bang. So I figured I'd start at the very beginning, way back when this is all helium and hydrogen. And then, <clears throat> you know, stars die, stars are born, you get carbon and iron and silicon, and it all comes together here on this little rock in the middle of nowhere. And then some people came along and they decided to take some of the sand and some of the rocks and they mixed it all together and they made this. And to talk to this, we can't just say hello. No, we have to have an operating system. We have to have a platform on which our code, our software, can directly speak to the metal and the sand inside of this machine. Otherwise, it's just a collection of, of dirt. So that's the operating system, sort of very short, but we'll go from there. Now, operating systems have been around pretty much since we've had computing. They are the foundation of what we describe in IT. And right now, we live in a very operating system-centric world. Operating systems are the center of the universe, just like Earth. So we have, you know, and this is the way it has been forever. Now, lately, in the last <coughs> 10 years, virtualization has been along longer than 10 years. But lately, in the last 10 years or so, virtualization has become very popular in IT because we are doing what is known in English as abstracting. We are taking the operating system and taking it away from the hardware. Before, you had one operating system on one machine done. But now you can have many operating systems on one machine. That is what hard or operating or virtualization does. It abstracts the operating system and makes it um, easier to handle. <clears throat> and then after virtualization, which was managing, you know, servers one at a time and moving them around, then we got to cloud. And cloud is just basically virtualization on steroids, okay? There are many similarities between how a virtual uh, data center manager like Overt works and how something like OpenStack and CloudStack works. And I'll be describing that a little bit as we go through. But these are just the first steps, okay? We are still talking about operating systems. There's nothing new under the sun here, not yet. Um, all we've done is turn physical machines into virtual machines. We still are dealing with the machines the same way we always do. We take an application, we code it to an operating system, we deploy it to the operating system, and then we, we deal with the operating system. Okay, so just like a real machine, a virtual machine still needs a manager. It still needs to be maintained by the system administrator. 
a developer still has to be careful on how they code their application. If I am a developer and I build an application and it is, you know, written for version 8.0 and version 8.1 of the operating system comes out and lo and behold, there's a new version of Java or something underneath and perhaps my application will break. This actually happened um, on the Overt project um, this spring when um, Java was changed inside Fedora and we weren't ready for it. And so bad things happened, okay? And if you are an application developer, you are aware that these things happen quite often. If you are a system administrator, you are aware that you have to do security patches and updates and all manner of, of daily activities to keep your operating systems, <clears throat> excuse me, to keep your operating systems and your virtual machines alive and healthy. So whether you're using a tool like Overt, which handles virtual machines um, in a robust manner, but not the cloud, or RDO, which is Red Hat's OpenStack um, um, version, which is the cloud. It's still handling virtual machines. It's actually handling the virtual machines almost identically to Overt. But what RDO and, and its parent project, OpenStack, and similar projects like CloudStack, what these all do is that they manage virtual machines with what is known as elasticity. And elasticity means that basically the applications inside the operating systems have the capability, if they are coded correctly, to come out and grab their own resources. I'm not running fast enough. I have too much input. I need more resources. And it's the applications that do that automatically, not a human being. And this is the big difference between tools like OpenStack and Overt. <clears throat> so this is from the movie Buckaroo Banzai. And the famous quote there is, no matter where you go, there you are. And that's pretty much the story of where we are with virtual machines. Nothing really has changed. Cloud has made it faster. Cloud has made it more automated. But we are still dealing with operating systems. And so we really, in a sense, have not made much progress. We've made things faster. We've made them easier to manage. But at the base level, it is still the same. And as I mentioned before, virtual manage machine management has a lot of overhead. This is the architecture for overt. I'm not going to go through this because it is early and I don't want you to go back to sleep. Okay, but basically, these are the basic components of how Overt puts things together and manages many virtual machines at the same time. It has scheduling, it has reports, it has shared storage, and yada, 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 and it's taking care of its virtualization clients at the same time. So it's a busy little project, and it's quite robust. And you have to deal with this if you are an administrator. This is OpenStack. Now, pardon me for having a pixelated picture. Um, it didn't really scale right. But you can get a pretty good idea that that's crazy. Okay? And by the way, this is OpenStack's documentation. This isn't like a competitor saying, oh, look at this. OpenStack is crazy. No, this is OpenStack. They have this on their website. You can go find it and get a clear picture, but honestly, even if it were clear, who could follow this? I'm not knocking OpenStack. It's a great tool, but it's got a lot of parts. And so you're going to have to deal with that if you are going to move to a cloud, a true cloud computing solution. Now, over makes things easier. I mean, I guess it has some overhead. It's not so bad. We've got a nice little interface. We can manage virtual machines, as we see here. We can manage clusters of machines, entire data centers of machines. So tools like Overt, um, there are other tools out there like Proxmox, 
which do similar um, um, activities, just so I can be ecumenical and talk about many tools. Um, VMware vSphere, if you really, really want to use a proprietary solution, that's very similar to what Overt does as well. Okay, so there are a lot of tools that make this easier, where you have scheduling. Whether you have one host and you're managing your data center and your VMs through there, or many hosts, or many data centers. Tools like Overt and Proxmox and VMware vSphere. These are all tools that handle this. I'm not trying to sell you on Overt. I'm trying to tell you that this is one way of handling virtual machines. It's a popular way. It's not a hard way, but you know, it is a way. And it's still all based, all of this is based on that tiny little operating system. Still there, running along. It's running Fedora, it's running Ubuntu, it's running Windows. Oh, sorry. It's very early. Okay. But yes, it's running that. It's running Solaris. It's all the same. So deep down inside, it's still the same model. And now we have containers. And now the story changes. Containers are very interesting to me because containers are actually something new. As Heichel said, they've been around for a long time. So what's made it new is what we like to call in, uh, in IT the hype cycle. Now, before I came to Red Hat, I was a technology journalist. I've written many books about Linux. I've written many articles about Linux and OS X and Windows and so forth and so on. And I see the hype cycle all the time. We are in the middle of a hype cycle for containers, mostly around Docker. But a hype cycle you may be familiar with around cloud computing. Five years ago, everything was cloud, cloud, cloud. Not DACA, 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 like Heichel said. No, it was cloud, cloud, cloud. We even have a term for it. In English, we call it cloud washing. It's when, so if I were a new company and I said, I want to sell my software to you, then I'm just going to go ahead and say, oh, it touches the cloud. That makes it all better, like fairy dust. Cloud, and it will make it all better. And now we are, we are almost there with containers. We have to be very careful. And this is the point of my discussion today. It's not to tell you that virtual machines are better. It's not to tell you that cloud is better. It's not to tell you that containers are better. It's to help you decide what you need. I don't care. If you walk out of here and you never touch a virtual machine again, that's fine. If it works for you, it works for you. But we have to be careful <clears throat> and understand what's going on so we can make informed decisions. So as Heichel said, and this is the part we're going to overlap quite a bit with his. So settle back, take a little nap. I'll be back in a minute with new stuff. Containers are different. They are not, when, when before when I said that like Earth in the early days before we had science where Earth was the center of the universe and, and now we have operating systems that are the center of the universe. Now it is different. Containers are application centric. And in this diagram, it's not Earth that's the center anymore, it's the sun. I mean, that's still not right either, but you know, they were making progress. Okay, containers are now the center, or I'm sorry, applications are now the center of the world. You worry about what your application needs when you're talking about containers. You're not worrying about what the operating system needs. You still have an operating system, it's still there, it's running underneath. But if you're an application developer, ah, now you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about that operating system so much. As Heichel described, if you have a container, 
and we're going to talk about Docker, although, again, that is not the only container game in town. But if you have a Docker container, you can just put exactly what you need in there and nothing else. I have my application. I have the libraries that are unique to that application. And everything else can talk to the host operating system below and get what it needs from there. Drivers, hardware resources, so forth and so on. This is the, four, this is the core fundamental technology that all containers provide. What Docker has done the only thing that's really made Docker different and special is Docker containers are portable. Docker containers are different from LXC and BSD jails and Solaris zones because they're much more portable. If I have two Docker machines, I like to use diagrams. One Docker machine, two Docker machine. If I have a container on one Docker machine, with the little application running inside, as long as they're both running Docker, I can take it. Now it's on the other machine, just like that. That's why everybody's paying attention to Docker. It's not that containers are new. It's that the portability is new. Very seamless. It makes life a lot easier. So I've told a pretty good story so far, right? I mean, everybody's, you know, you've heard Hegel's talk. You're looking at this and you're saying, oh, this is so cool. How do I get one of these? Because really, containers are mostly awesome. But they're not completely awesome. Like all new technology, there are problems. There are idiosyncrasies. This is not, Docker is not a mature technology. Containers are mature. But we're doing things with containers that people weren't really thinking about when they invented this uh, technology. So there are problems. And this is where Atomic comes in. This is what this project is all about. <clears throat> they want to simplify things. Saw this diagram before. We have many components within Atomic. Atomic is about holding on and maintaining those containers. That is the simplest explanation for what Atomic does. This is also what CoreOS does. And to the question earlier, what's the difference between the two? I'll get to that. He had one answer. I've got another. OK. They're close, but not, you know, they. OK, so we're doing this with Docker. We've said this before. This is the technology that's hot. This is the one we're going to use. Personally, if it were me, I would just go ahead and use LXC because LXC is built deep within the Linux kernel already. And with a few tweaks, it could be just as portable as Docker. But nobody asked me. I'm just a community guy. OK, you do what you can. Um, but no, and this is not to take away from Docker. It is a very intriguing technology. We'll see how they do. They're still riding that wave of hype, and I hope that they will keep up with that. And I don't want to go too much into what Docker is, but since Heiko did a good job, but for those of you who were not here for his presentation a little while ago, Docker basically takes um, namespace, restricts it, walls it off, and basically allows you to keep your applications and its libraries inside, and then it adds that extra portability where you can take containers and move them around. And as you see, you saw on the previous slide, you know, containers are good, but if you don't handle them right, you know, all sorts of bad things could start happening. So we have Docker, we have RPM OS3. For me, this is actually the, the unique thing that separates Atomic with CoreOS. As described in the earlier presentation, RPM OS3 is a tool in which that you use RPM packages, but you deploy them in a Git-like fashion so that when you roll things out, you roll them out as a single Atomic unit not individual packages. You set up your configuration, and you hit a button, off it goes. That is actually where the name Atomic comes from. People think, oh, Atomic, we're talking about the little Atomic containers. No, no, we're actually talking about RPM OS 3. 
we're talking about the the part where you roll things out in atomic discrete units. These units can be very large or they can be very small, but they are discrete and they are separately maintained, just like a Git deployment. When you make a change in Git, when you make a change to the code, if you fork a new branch, that's the branch. Now, the, the advantage here of this is, well, okay, deployment is easier. When you make a change to your host, you can just do it with RPM OS 3. But the other advantage is if you make a mistake. Because if you make a mistake, you don't have to go back and find the one package that's wrong and throwing everything off and making your server throw up. No, you just hit a button and say revert, <laughs> done. Everything reverts back in one atomic unit. You go back to the initial state that you started. Then you have time to figure out what went wrong, fix it, and redeploy. That is the genius of RPM OS 3. We're very happy about it. The, we, atomic consumes a lot of projects. You saw that in the earlier diagram. It consumes Docker and SE Linux and base RPM technology. And as has been said, Kubernetes and other orchestration tools. But RPM OS 3 is something that was developed inside Red Hat. And it is an open source project. It was part of the GNOME project. And now it's being modified and, and built for Atomic and used there. So we're very happy about this. We're glad to lend this to the community and in an open source fashion. And then there's orchestration. Now this was touched on a bit in the earlier presentation, but there are actually more than one levels of um, orchestration. Initially, and you saw the diagram earlier where it had gear D on the side. I'll, I'll tell you the little um, backstory. Initially, we were going to use GearD because OpenShift uses GearD to orchestrate the gears and containers within OpenShift, which you know sounds a lot like what we're doing in Atomic, in much the same way that we want it. But it didn't quite do everything we needed. So we decided to set that aside and consume other technologies. And there are actually um, three levels of orchestration within Atomic. One at the core level is Cockpit. <coughs> Cockpit is another Red Hat open source project that basically allows you to manage the placement and um, scheduling of individual containers. So basically, it's sort of like a very simple virtualization machine manager. It, takes your, it says, OK, here's container one, two, three. They're here. They're on. You're done. It's a nice graphic interface for that. Then there's the Kubernetes layer. Kubernetes is a Google project. We are consuming that. And what Kubernetes does, <coughs> it orchestrates the containers across, or I'm sorry, the applications. So when you have multiple containers in one application, something has to manage that application across multiple containers. That is what Kubernetes does. And then the third level of orchestration is Apache Mesos. And what Mesos will allow you to do is um, um, orchestrate containers across multiple hosts. So you have on one level one application across many containers, and on another level you have many containers across many hosts. So these are three levels of orchestration here. This is not an easy problem to solve, but that is the problem that um, Atomic is trying to solve. CoreOS, to be fair, is working on this too. I don't think they're consuming Mesos. And right now, their equivalent of Cockpit is a command line interface. But they are working very heavily with the Kubernetes project. And they're trying to make that work. And Kubernetes is very intriguing. This is something that even Overt is working on. <coughs> because Overt manages virtual machines. And if you take any way from anything from this presentation, remember, containers are not virtual machines. They look like virtual machines. Sometimes they behave like virtual machines, but they are not virtual. But in some respects, they can be managed almost identically. And the overt team is actually looking at um, managing individual virtual machines running Project Atomic 
and then using Kubernetes to manage the containers within. We'll see if that works. It's very early days. So that was containers. And I apologize for the redundancy in the presentations. Okay, but I wanted to kind of go over all that with you, to go over virtualization and cloud and containers and kind of lay it all out for you and say, okay, here you go. What are you going to do? And what started this talk for me was last summer when we announced Project Atomic, there were reporters at a press conference. And I used to be a reporter. And trust me, I know sometimes they're kind of blunt. They want to see if there's a real story here or if you're just trying to sell them something. So one of the reporters asked a question that really bothered me. He said, does this mean that operating systems are dead? What? Okay, so first off, I'm working for Red Hat. So if you tell me that operating systems are dead, I'm probably going to have heart palpitations. Okay. But then, too, are they really dead? I mean, is the, or is this, you know, are containers going to be something that are going to be used and that will be the wave of the future <coughs> and we will be able to walk away from the operating system? It's a, it's a concern. I mean, when you look at one of the things that's been going on, and I won't go into this too much, so you have things like this. These are all apps. I mean, what's exciting about developing for the Linux kernel anymore? What's exciting about developing for an operating system anymore? If I want to make money, I want to get one of these apps going, right? I want to be the next big Twitter or Tinder or whatever. I don't know. I just ask my kids. They tell me the fun, what the cool stuff is. But if you're a developer and you, if money is all you care about, then mobile platform is very easy for you. That's a very attractive position. So containers sort of make life so much more easier for application developers. Why wouldn't they just move away from operating systems? And here's what I would say, and this sort of applies to developers and administrators and, and, and IT managers and system people all like. You have to think about where you're going to innovate. This is the key to the solution. There's not a lot of innovation going on in IT. I mean, I already told you the story that up until cloud computing, we were still basically using operating systems. And yes, we were using them in a better way. But what we had done was essentially made the car faster. In the early days, when we were using IBM mainframes, the car was an old Model T. Now, when we were using OpenStack for cloud computing, it's still a car. It's still an engine and tires and brakes and things, but it's, now it's a Ferrari. It's a pretty fast car, but it's still a car, and it's still driving on the road. Containers make things different. Where does your innovation lie? Where is that going to be? And, and to kind of, bring this, uh, kind of lay this out, I'll show you a couple of examples of things that are new and things that are old, and you decide which one might be better for you. So new, micro-manufacturing or 3D printing. Have, has anybody seen 3D printing in action? That's kind of cool. I mean, you sit there, you press a button, and you get a little, you know, plastic doohickey, right? But actually, it's actually more serious than that. The best use I've seen for um, 3D printing is think about prosthetics. Think about artificial limbs, okay? Right now, in the U.S. and in Europe, too, it takes a long time to get a prosthetic limb. And I know this from experience, because while I don't have a prosthetic limb, I did have to wear a brace for a long time as a child. And to wear the brace, you have to stand there for 30 minutes while they wrap a cast around your body and it let it harden. They cut the cast off. They send it off to a factory. And seven weeks later, you have a brace that fits you. Okay, 
that's not so bad. And if you're a fully grown adult, it's really not that bad because you're not going to grow. Well, you might grow a little. I, sorry, I grow too much. But really, you're not, gonna, you're not going up and down. Not really. But think about that for a child. Okay? That's bad. Seven weeks for a kid? If any of you have children, you know that two months, one summer, and that kid's grown, you know, a few centimeters. That changes a prosthetic dramatically. Seven weeks is too long. And sometimes it's longer, two months or three months. This is where 3D printing is really awesome because you can have 3D printing that basically you generate the image of what you need, take the measurements, you, and you print it out in one week, maybe even three days, and give it to the child. And four months later, when they've outworn their clothes and they go to something new, now they can get a new limb cheaply and efficiently. This is really good. And it's things like this that make 3D printing really intriguing. That's the new. This is the old. I'm not going to 3D print a car. I could, but it would be insanely expensive and very complicated and probably would take forever to make work. For a lot of things, like cars and chairs and this little doohickey, Probably a good idea to have mass manufacturing. That's the old model, but it still works. And bringing that back to you, new does not always mean better. New does not always mean it's the best thing for you. And for IT, operating systems are still the foundation. Everything that I've told you about today, the virtualization, from the, you know, the KBM and the Zen virtualization um, platforms to Overt, to OpenStack, to CloudStack, Docker, RPM OS3. Everything I've told you about today has been built on an operating system. That is not changing. So for you and your companies, you're going to have to kind of figure out where this is going to fit. How do you want to use innovation and technology moving forward? Don't just jump on containers because it's the coolest, most awesome thing ever and I have to have it. Okay? Maybe it works for you. Maybe it won't. Maybe there's something in between. Maybe you just need to use your operating systems better. Maybe you need to deploy a virtualization platform. Maybe you need to deploy a cloud platform. There's so many solutions in between, okay? It's not a crime to hold back and think about what you need and pay for only what you need and what you want. It is, however, kind of a crime to jump in with the latest and greatest and not be ready for it. Because you can build a car with any tool, like Legos. You can do that. But why would you want to? Doesn't mean you really should. So with that, merci. And I will take any questions you might have. And Heiko will translate from French, because he's going to help. One confusion I have is when to use containers and when not to use containers. Would you have an example of when it's inappropriate to containerize? I think probably right now you should, well, because containers are new, I would certainly advocate using them, not using them in a production environment. Um, I, would, I would definitely use them in a developer or test environment first. But beyond that, in a general business sense, I think that um, container technology um, is very intriguing when you are building um, applications in a DevOps model, 
if you've gone down that road and you want to do agile deployment because containers make things a, a lot easier when you are in a situation where you are developing in an agile way and almost do, well and you're doing continuous integration because then what containers is very they're very attractive you're not worrying about the underlying operating system as much you still have to apply security updates to anything within the container. So if library X gets, you know, an update and that library X is inside the container, you still have to update it. But that doesn't happen as often as the underlying operating system might change. So if you're in an agile situation or if you're fully committed to DevOps, then I would invite you to look at containers and see if that's going to be a fit for you. If you're not doing that, if your development is slower and in more of a waterfall fashion and not really that, you know, fast, then you might want, you might want to step back and say, mm, maybe containers is what I need. Wait. Thank you for the talk first. Um, and I'm bouncing back on the, the first question. Uh, in models that have um, high, uh, that I highly parallel, I, I mean uh, by that, that um, maybe I need to make a simulation and I have to, um, to have in concurrency maybe a thousand models running at the same time. So in this case, containers are, uh, maybe, maybe let's say they did all run on Python so I will have to run them in parallel, like a thousand, a bunch of a thousand of them. So is it kind of the the uh, right kind of way, instead of you know using a, a huge, uh, you know, a huge computer and a virtualization platform or using a cloud? When you're in early stage, I mean, pr for prototyping, what do you think of that? I would say um, that is, yeah, that is certainly a good model to use containers for. My only caveat for you would be to ensure that you have your, you know, you have those apps properly um, managed and orchestrated across those containers. Okay, and that's kind of the trick right now because Docker itself has very little management tools. It's just basically make a container, throw the, you know, containerize your app, you know, start it, stop it, done. So if you can find, so part one of my answer is if you can make sure that you properly orchestrate it across different containers, then yes, I would do that. Now, the trick would be, though, if you start that way in early prototyping, you know, what good is it going to do if you don't continue that? Like in production, if you don't deploy it that way in production, then all the testing you're doing is probably, I mean, you're doing stress testing and, you know, things like that, then yes. But if you're actually trying to make sure this whole thing will work in a production environment, you may as well at that point, if it does work, move it to production and do it that way. So I guess because... I, I would think it would be much harder to move it from the container model to a virtual machine model in production. Not impossible, but it's just one more layer of complexity. And I'm lazy, so I'm all about doing it easy. You start with what you finish. When I start with wine in the evening, I stay with wine all night. It's all good. I hope that helped. Okay. Oh, these people are making me work today. Hi, um, the the company Canonical seems to to want to build uh, the next gen of uh, Ubuntu uh, operating system based totally on containers. Uh, if you look at the architecture of uh, Ubuntu Touch, which is the um, the OS for the for the phone and tablets, and uh, the next gen of uh, Ubuntu operating system, 
uh, everything. The core apps are in containers. Uh, there is a content hub to uh, to transfer content between uh, between apps, core apps, and um, third party apps. Uh, what do you think about this direction and about uh, an entire operating system based on containers? Okay, so first Ubuntu, so no, no, kidding. No, um, actually no, we've, we, there has been thinking along these lines because it makes a lot of sense. If, if containers truly isolate the application, then if I am, one of the problems in Linux land is that if I develop an application for Fedora, it will probably not run as is over on Ubuntu or OpenSUSE, or Slackware, or any of the others. So containers is, are very intriguing in that way, because theoretically, if I have Docker on Ubuntu and Docker on Fedora, then I can just, again, I can take it, I can pick it up, move it, boom, done. That's very intriguing. There's a few problems. Um, one, the graphical interface with containers, like hitting the applications inside a container, it's not, it's not there yet. So these are the problems that I think that company you were talking about, and I'm sorry I didn't catch the name, but no, I didn't. Was it canonical or? Okay, I didn't understand. I'm sorry, I was around the pillar. So yeah, no, no, I'm not trying to be rude this time. I mean, I make fun of canonical, and Mark Shuttleworth, but not this time, I'm sorry. So, no, but seriously. So, that's the problem they're gonna have to solve. Okay, because right now everything with Docker and containers is all, it's basically on the command line, right? So, you're gonna have to build this, a very nice interface to make that happen. If they do, I think it's a very intriguing use for containers. If they can get it working with the graphical interface, so a regular user off the street can take their application from their computer and put it on their phone or wherever they want to do it, or another computer, and they're really going to have to solve the security model. Be oh, LXC, yeah. Um, yeah, and see, actually, <clears throat> now, see, that's even better. Because I'm not anti-Docker, um, but I, I, I've, I'm much more familiar with LXC. So for me, it's like, okay, I use Emacs. Whoever uses VI, I'm sorry, you know, but that's just, that's just me, right? You use VI, I use Emacs, I like LXC, they like, you know, you, you might like Docker. It's okay. But LXC um, is, is gonna be better, I think, They've got, because part two of this is they have to lock it down. They have to make sure it's not, because as Hegel said earlier, containers leak like crazy. That's why Atomic has SE Linux and rules-based security in there. So if a container tries to do something stupid or bad, SE Linux just slaps it down and takes care of it, hopefully, you know. And that's what Canonical will have to solve too, the graphical problem and the security problem. If they can make that work, it will be very intriguing. Oh, you have a question? When you said uh, you and Heikel about uh, operating system, it's ending uh, today. Well, that's not an operating system uh, uh, ecosystem, but you said Docker needs operating system, and you say we, we're going to create operating system with Docker, I say that's the same thing. And I don't very understand what is the difference between Atomic Project, Fedora Atomic Project, I say Ubuntu Atomic Project, or what else. <laughs> but, but then, because you use RPM, RPM it's Red Hat approach or Fedora approach, but you could use the same thing with uh, .deb or uh, Overway. I'll give you a prize later. No. Um, yes, you can do that. And we want people to do that with Atomic. I mean, right now, Atomic is not, 
Atomic is not its own operating system. It are tools that run on top of an operating system. So you run it on Fedora, you run it on top of RHEL, you run it on top of CentOS. But there's nothing that says you can't run it on top of OpenSUSE or Ubuntu. In fact, OS3, well, I say RPM OS3, Haeckel says OS3, he's actually a little bit more right. Okay, what we use for Atomic is RPM OS3, but OS3 is just one part of the puzzle. There, are, there can be and there is work being done on Deb OS3. And that means that Debian packages can be deployed in this manner with the Atomic methodology. Okay, and all the other tools, well, you know, Ubuntu and Debian can consume those now. So your thinking is actually very interesting to all of us. I'm, I mean, I work for Red Hat, but for me, the more di operating systems, the more distributions that use a certain tool, the better. Like I want Overt, which only runs on Fedora and you know, in a, a Red Rel, basically the Red Hat family. I want Overt on Ubuntu. I want Overt on SUSE Linux and OpenSUSE. These are good things. It's better for everybody. I hope containers will make that easy. We just containerized Overt. Um, we had a blog about it this week where we actually, now you can deploy Overt as a container. So we'll see how well that works. But did I answer your question? I mean, for me, you still have to have the operating system underneath. Docker's got to sit on something. We have not gone to a, a we've not gotten to a point where things are truly stateless. I mean, there's been some work done in web application environment where you could actually have a full application running on a web page that wasn't like based on Java or ActiveX or some other stuff. I mean, there are ways of doing this, but they are very early and very immature. So we still need that operating system underneath. And I personally, I know I work for Red Hat, I hope it's all the operating systems. That's the one thing that I think holds Linux back. You know, there's a lot, everybody's got a different distribution. It's too many for one person to code for. We don't have a good, like, I don't know uh, if you've heard of Evernote, um, which is a very nice application. And you, if you use it on Linux, you have to use, you know, the web application, really, to make it work. I want Evernote on all Linux. I love Evernote. You know, so, but that's me. So, any other questions? Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you, Brian.